Welcome, welcome to everybody, welcome. My name's Mike Denham, and I'm delighted to be able to welcome you to our kickoff program for the 2021-22 edition of the Florida Lecture Series produced by the Lawton Child Center for Florida History. It's great to be back uh, after last year's hiatus. Uh, I know that it was a very rough year for everyone, very difficult year. And I'm sure that the COVID, COVID e epidemic touched everyone at, in some way in this room, at some level. Near the beginning of the outbreak, we lost our beloved secretary, Mary Wilson, in our political science, history political science department. And of course, she worked with me very closely as well. She was a loyal employee at Florida Southern for over 50 years. And for Mary and all the other folks we've lost in this epidemic, I'd like to have a moment of silence uh, to remember them. Before we welcome our distinguished speaker, I'd like to say a few words about this year's programs and some other things. First, I really appreciate you coming out tonight. I had no idea who could make it, who would make it. Um, and I've got, we've got a great, uh, great first, first evening. Lots and lots of folks out there. I appreciate that everyone is abiding by FSU's indoor mask, F FSC's indoor mask mandate. FSU does not have one, I don't think. Uh, at any rate, uh, if you forgot your mask, we, we have some extras. And I want to take the opportunity to welcome uh, my secretary, Isabel Sear, who's with us for the first time tonight. She's got extra mask, and she can provide you also with some uh, extra brochures and other things if you'd like to get on our mailing list if you're not on the mailing list, if you're here particularly for the first time. Uh, next month, our October 28th program will welcome writer Jason Buick, who will join us from Dallas, Texas, uh, and he'll take us through the wild world of Florida real estate development in the 1950s. He was able to share with us uh, the cover, uh, the picture for the cover uh, of the brochure. You probably noticed it. It's, it's, it was a layout, of course, of a, of a development that he wrote about. Um, and then on November 4th, our venue will be the Polk County History Center. For the first time um, ever, we're going to basically leave Florida Southern Campus and go down to Bartow, and we're going to commemorate um, a marvelous book publishing project. Um, we're going to welcome two distinguished uh, editors and historians who edited a, a very, very large uh, book on the Florida governors. They assembled a team of historians to write essays on each governor, not just, by, uh, not just encyclopedia entries, but full-length essays on each governor. Over the, uh, it was over a decade in the making, and the Governors of Florida was a monumental publishing venture and won the Florida Book Award uh, Gold Medal for Nonfiction. And I want to thank our bookstore, who's with us tonight, uh, uh, for working with the University Press of Florida for offering this book uh, at a very specially reduced price for that event. So that'll be November 4th down in Bartow at the Polk County Historical Center. In the spring, we have three more uh, programs on topics ranging from America's lawyer, Chesterfield Smith, a great Polk Countyan, Floridian, and American. Uh, we're also gonna have a great program uh, by Janice Owens, who's, gonna, who's a, a, a great novelist who writes Florida fiction, and also uh, uh, a program, our last program in March is going to be on the Marielle Boatlift. The Florida Lecture Series began, of course, back in 1996 as a way to introduce students, faculty, and the general public to Florida life and culture from a wide range of subjects, including history, literature, public affairs, environment, law, music, art, and numerous other disciplines. In 2001, we established the Lawton Child Center for Florida History, and we expanded our charge of engaging Florida history and expanding the lecture series. Over the years, our speakers have included governors and public officials. We've hosted Pulitzer Prize winners and National Book Award winners over the years as well. 
Over those years and, and years, we've been blessed with wonderful financial support by many of you. And I want to give you a special thank you for all of you who have do who've donated to our efforts this year and in years past. It's, it's your donations that allow us to bring these programs to our community free of, free of charge. And it's going to be another great year, beginning tonight. Now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's special guest. For more than 30 years as an investigative journalist for the St. Pete Times, now Tampa Bay Times, Craig Pittman covered the wildest stories Florida has to offer. Tonight, he'll share many of them with us. Currently, his columns can be found in the Florida Phoenix. Uh, he was born in Pensacola, but educated in LA. That's right, Lower Alabama <laughs> at Troy University. Craig honed his skills as a journalist on the student newspaper. Pittman's reporting was, also, was such a, an annoyance that one dean labeled him the most destructive force on campus. Craig was a Florida panhandle guy, relocated in the hurricane's eye of central Florida, where Florida's wacky characteristics was on display every day. Craig's primary beat was the environment, but gradually that expanded to include all manner of Florida cultural affairs. Along the way, he distinguished himself as one of the nation's top environmental writers. While holding down his day job as a reporter, Pittman was able to author serious books on manatees, Florida wetlands, and panthers, which earned him notoriety as an award-winning writer. Many of those are out available tonight. The New York Times bestselling author Pittman is the author of six books, including Paving Paradise, Manatee Insanity, Cattail, the, the Weird Battle, Wild Battle to Save the Florida Panther, and Oh Florida, which of course was the subject of his previous appearance here. Uh, but tonight's program, he'll share with some of, some of his old, oddest wildlife as, the, uh, as well as its quirky, quirkiest people as compiled in his most recent book, The State You're In. Um, among the many accolades of the state you're in is a blurb on the dust jacket by Cynthia Barnett. Many of you will remember her wonderful program here on Florida Springs that she gave a while back. According to Cynthia, the book spans 30 years of extraordinary reporting. The state you're in is a celebration of Florida and its most versatile writer, pee in your pants funny in one chapter and utterly humane in the next. Craig Pittman is Florida's own Mark Twain. Well, in, in 2020, the Florida Heritage Book Festival honored Pittman as a living legend. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the legend himself, Craig Pittman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I, I always, I'm, you guys are six feet away, I think I can take this off. Um, um, I, I always say allegedly a legend, I'm, I'm not too sure about that. I always think of a legend as being someone who's deceased. So uh, it makes me a little uncomfortable. Although I have to say, th this is a much better venue than the one I was in last night. Last night I was speaking down in Cape Coral uh, for the, uh, an event sponsored by the Cape Coral History Museum, which is actually housed in a double wide trailer that used to be the pro shop for their golf course. And so they couldn't have the event there, so it was held in a funeral home. Um, and uh, one of my friends said, you're probably one of the few people to headline there who got a chance to enjoy the, the ceremony. Um, but we had a lively discussion. I hope we'll have an equally lively discussion here tonight. Uh, so uh, anyway, my name is Craig Pittman. I'm a columnist for the Florida Phoenix, and I write books. Um, and uh, uh, it, it really is uh, a joy to share some of these stories with you. Uh, from my, my latest book, which um, I don't want to say it sums up my, the body of my work, but it, it continues the work that I enjoy doing, which is telling people about my favorite state. Uh, you know, we're supposed to be the sunshine state, which of course in classic Florida uh, style is misleading because some of our cities actually get more rain on an annual basis than Seattle does. Uh, I think we should change our nickname to the most interesting state because I really think we could back that up. Um, all right, so... Um, let me rewind back to when I was here last time uh, talking about my book, Oh Florida, 
how America's weirdest state influences the rest of the country. Um, that was based, that actually got started as a blog that I wrote for a month for Slate. Uh, they wanted me to blog about Florida and tell about what a wild and crazy place it was. And of course the only problem was they only gave me a month to do that. And I had a really hard time packing everything in. And towards the end of the month, my editor uh, said, I really hope you're gonna turn this into a book. So I thought, hey, what a great idea. So I wrote up a book proposal, an agent sent it around to various New York publishers. 16 of them said, no, we don't think anybody wants to read a book about Florida. Why would you even bother us with this? And then one, thank God, St. Martin's Press said, we like this idea, let's do it, and put it out. And uh, it surprised everyone. Uh, it actually got rave reviews in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Los Angeles Times. Um, it even made the New York Times bestseller list for all of a week, which was pretty exciting. And me meant that, the, that meant that when the paperback came out, they could put on their New York Times bestseller. Um, and it even won a, uh, a gold medal from the Florida Book Awards, which for a while I wore around my neck all the time, like I was Flavor Flav, you know, with this big clock. Um, and people, the, the great thing about going around and talking about that book is that afterwards people would come up to me and tell me their Florida stories, uh, some of which I can, I can repeat, some I can't. Um, my favorite one was the couple that came up to me and told me about how they found out that their new neighbor was running an illegal nudist bed and breakfast. And the way they found out is they gave their kids a trampoline for Christmas. <laughs> mom, mom, mom. Uh, but the other thing happened, that happened was that people would come up and say, when are you going to write a sequel? We want a sequel. We want an, an O Florida 2 electric boogaloo. When are you going to put that out? And I, I kept having to tell them, well, I feel like I kind of said everything I wanted to say in this book. No, no, no. There's so many more wild and crazy things going on in Florida. You need to write a sequel. Well, I thought, well, but I, I just couldn't think of one. I couldn't. And so I went off and wrote my Panther book, which was a book I wanted to do for 20 years. And I finally got that out of, the, out of my system. Well, and then it occurred to me, okay, maybe there's a way to do a sequel without doing a sequel. And so, uh, so I, I'm calling this new book The Son of O Florida, uh, the state you're in. Um, it's not a direct sequel to O Florida uh, because what it is, it's not a, a one you know, coherent argument all the way through about Florida being both wacky and influential, but rather it's a, it's a collection of uh, interesting stories, unusual stories, offbeat stories, and columns that I've written over the last 30 years. It, 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 but as a collection, it sort of coheres uh, as having the same attitude and the same goal as O Florida had, which was, of course, to celebrate Florida and its glorious weirdness in just about every way you could think. Um, and so uh, there are 51 chapters in there. Some of them are short, some are long. If I'd been smart, I would have made it 52 so you could read one chapter a week for a year, but I just wasn't thinking. Um, and there, the book is divided up into four sections. The first section is Florida men and women. The second section is crime does not pay enough, uh, and the third section is wild wildlife, and then the fourth section is the state you're in, because it's more general stuff about, about Florida. Uh, but first, let me tell you a little bit about that, that wonderful cover. It's by uh, Andy Marlette, who's the editorial cartoonist for my hometown paper, the Pensacola News Journal. You may know Andy's dad, Doug Marlette. He drew the uh, comic strip Kudzu for a long time, uh, and Andy has just launched his own comic strip uh, called Shrimp and Grits. Um, so, uh, you know, look for that popping up. But An I visited Pensacola to do a talk about O Florida, and Andy drew a cartoon of me for the paper that looked somewhat like this. And so when I pitched this book idea to my publisher, I said, and you need to get Andy Marlette to do the cover. And this is what it should look like. And they, they agreed because they were big fans of Andy's work too. Um, the only problem with that cover is I wish they could have gotten someone handsome for the cover model, but they had to work with what they had. Um, so, uh, the, like I said, the first section is about Florida men and Florida women. So some of the Florida men who are featured uh, include uh, this gentleman, Alligator Ron Bergeron, who was just playing Ron Bergeron for a long time. Ron, Ron Bergeron, who is a rodeo champion in Davie, and in fact, the Davie Rodeo Arena is named after him. He's a, uh, a paver, a developer, uh, an Everglades airboat captain, uh, and a gator wrestler. And uh, that last part is what got him in trouble. He was showing some people around his ranch, yes, he's a cattle rancher too, and saw an alligator in a pond and said, let me show you something. And he ran over and dove into the pond and proceeded to wrestle the alligator to show off for these visitors. Well, the alligator actually got the best of him and chomped on his hand and took him to the bottom of the pond and started to do the death roll. Well, Ron knew to 
punched the alligator in the nose repeatedly, and it finally let go of him, and he swam it, swam back up to the surface and emerged mangled, but, but okay, went to the ER, got treatment for his hand. His fingers are still kind of bent where the gator chomped on him. Well, of course, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission sent an officer out to talk to him about this because what he had done was illegal. It's called molesting an alligator. So, so the officer interviewed him and he freely admitted what he'd done, showed him his fingers and everything, showed him the medical records so that they basically they had the whole case right in front of them. The officer wrote up the whole thing, took it over to the prosecutors in Hardy County and they said, Ron Bergeron, yeah, no, we're not going to file charges against that guy. We just, we don't think you can prove it. So, um, so Ron skated on that charge. Well, then subsequently he got appointed to the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. So as far as I know, he's the only politician to ever be investigated by the agency he wound up leading. <laughs> and, and he proudly calls himself now Alligator Ron. And if you call his office in Davie, you, and you get put on hold, you'll hear Tanya Tucker singing the Ballad of Alligator Ron. <laughs> um, another one is uh, Ben Henry Pooley from uh, Santa Rosa County. Ben Henry Pooley was a county employee. He was hired to run their mosquito control program on a three to two vote, and then he ticked off so many people that he was fired on a three to two vote. So for a long time, his nickname was three to two Pooley. Uh, well, when he got ousted as a county employee, Ben Henry got a new job as a uh, radio commentator. He had an hour-long program on the local radio station that turned him into sort of a rural Rush Limbaugh he, because he knew where all the bodies were buried. He made up funny and kind of mean nicknames for all the politicians. And he would get on the air and just talk about everybody. And you know they used to talk about appointment television. This was appointment radio in Santa Rosa County. The audience loved him. The audience was huge. But the politicians he talked about did not love him at all. And uh, in fact, um, one person kept hiring people to go kill him. Um, there was a, they blew up his trailer. They tried several other ways. The most famous way was that they, uh, they hired a hitman to, to kill him. And the hitman, of course, was actually a Florida Department of Law Enforcement agent. Because I think a general rule of life in Florida is that anybody you think is a hitman, nine times out of 10, they're going to be an undercover cop. Uh, well, this, the FDLE came in and, and told Ben Henry what was going on and took him out in the woods and smeared ketchup in his hair and laid him down on the ground and, and told him to close his eyes and took pictures of him looking dead. And then they also took his pinky ring. Yes, he was one of those classic rural characters that wore a diamond pinky ring. They took his pinky ring and the photos and took them to the, to the client and said, look, he's dead, pay us the $10,000. Well, uh, the guy they arrested as the, as the guy who hired the hitman turned out to be a candidate for county commission. He was a former commissioner. He was running for re-election. He had $9,000 and change under the front seat of his car, but he said, no, no, those are campaign donations. That's not a payoff to the hit man. Um, they arrested him, put him in jail. Uh, he died of a heart attack eight days later, so he never went to trial. And of course, everybody in Santa Rosa County said, the FDLE killed him. So the whole thing backfired on them. Uh, but it became known as the ketchup murder. And uh, Ben Henry, of course, gloried in all the attention. And he said, you know, I never have any trouble getting insurance because nobody can kill me. Um, and, uh, and then I, I profiled Wilbur Snap. Wilbur Snap, who was the ballpark organist at the Clearwater Phillies uh, minor league ballpark and also played for, for spring training for the Philadelphia Phillies there in Clearwater. Well, one, during one game, one Clearwater Phillies game, there was a call at the plate. It was a close call, and the umpire called it against the Phillies. And oh, the crowd booed and booed. And Wilbur decided to comment on this by playing three blind mice. And the umpire took offense and pointed up at him and then did this. And that's how Wilbur became the first ballpark organist in America to be ejected from the game because of his song choice. Um, and it, it, you know, this was sort of pre-internet, so he couldn't go viral. But if you could go viral in those days, that's what happened because he got attention from the Today Show, got written up in newspapers all over the country. And when he died, he actually got a, an obituary in the New York Times, Wilbur Snap, organist who was ejected from game. Uh, and then there, were some, there are some Florida women prom prominently featured in the book. Uh, the first chapter, in fact, is about mermaids. Florida has a mermaid industry. This is not something Chamber of Commerce talks about, but they ought to. Um, of course, the, the, the genesis for all of these mermaids is Wikiwachi Springs State Park. Have, have you guys ever been to Wikiwachi Springs? You know what I'm talking about? Yes, exactly. 
1947, a former Navy frogman named Newton Perry bought the spring, hauled out all the junk cars and that refrigerators that people had thrown in there, built an underwater theater, and then hid air hoses all around the place and hired nubile young women to swim around in 60-pound prosthetic tails and wave at the tourists. And this became a huge roadside attraction in that part of Florida. Uh, Elvis came to visit, other big celebrities came by, uh, but you know, and then Disney opened and a lot of the classic Florida roadside attractions started to, started to die. And so around 2000, business at Wikiwatchie Springs had <clears throat> tailed off suffi sufficiently that, uh, that they, it was, it was going to close and they were, the owners were going to sell it. Well, the state, to its credit, uh, said, you know, we don't want a developer to buy this. We don't want a water bottler to buy this. So the state stepped in and bought it and turned it into a state park. And the mermaids, as a result, are now state employees. Florida is the only state where the list of government jobs includes professional mermaid, which is, you know, uh, I think wonderful, although it has led to some interesting discussions about the use of state tax dollars to pay for waterproof lipstick and shell bras. Um, so uh, uh, a lot of the, that, that attraction there has thus sort of started, is sort of, sort of like starter stock for mermaids all around the state. I, I interviewed mermaids in Pensacola, mermaids in Fort Lauderdale, mermaids in the Jacksonville area, um, and it was quite fascinating. One man I talked to who lives, still lives near Wikiwachi Springs calls himself the Mer Taylor, and he makes the custom designed tails for all of these mermaids uh, and makes quite a, quite a living at it. He used to be a merman at Wikiwachi Springs, but he said he quit after what he called mermaid politics, which is not a phrase you would hear in any other state but Florida. Um, my favorite of all the mermaids I interviewed was the lady in the red bikini there, bikini top there in the middle, uh, who uh, does fire eating as well as uh, various swimming activities. She said, I'm 47, thank God water lifts. Um, and so, uh, let's see, and then um, uh, I talked to uh, the woman, a woman in uh, Delray Beach who holds the Guinness Book of World Record for being the most tattooed woman alive. I think that last word is the most important part of that sentence, by the way. Uh, and she, uh, she had been married for years to a man who would not let her get any tattoos, even though he had tattoos. When he died, she said, that's it, I'm, I'm, I'm going for it. And so she, started, she got her first tattoo and liked it. She started going in for more. And the first time she went in for one that was really complicated, it went all the way around her waist, uh, the tattoo artist said, you know, this is going to take a while, and it's probably going to be pretty painful. Why don't I get somebody to sit with you and talk to you while you're going through it? And so he, he picked this other customer to sit with her and talk to her. Well, they, they turned out to have so much in common that they wound up, uh, wound up as a couple. And, and so they're still together today. And uh, he actually is in the Guinness Book of World Records, too as the most tattooed senior citizen male. Um, but uh, she assured me that tattoos are not what really brought him together. It was the fact that he was a great kisser. Um, and uh, uh, I spent some time with these two women in St. Petersburg who run a dog grooming salon during the week. And on the weekends, they pack up their things and head down to the Everglades and are professional python hunters. Uh, they, you know, they actually go out and patrol around on the levees in their truck, and when they see a Python, uh, they jump out of the truck and one of them, uh, you know, grabs the head and holds on and the other one kind of lies down on the, on the python and tries to wear it out even though it might pee and poop all over them. They, they refer to that as the sweet smell of success, by the way. Um, uh, we, we spent, I spent about six hours riding around in their truck with them on the levee looking for pythons, me and a, a couple of photographers, and uh, we saw snakes but we did not see pythons. Uh, in fact, at one point we saw something slithering across the road and my photographer immediately jumped out of the car and they're like, whoa, 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 Tex, come on back. That's a cottonmouth moccasin. You don't want to get a hold of that one. Uh, and so at the end of the night, I said, I'm kind of disappointed we didn't see a python. Oh, you want to see a python? Why didn't you say so? So they stopped the truck and go around back and open up the back. Right behind where I had been sitting all night, there was a black locker and they opened the locker and inside was a white cotton bag and in it was an eight foot python they'd caught the night before and just hadn't turned in yet. It had been there the whole time, I didn't even know. Uh, let's see, there we go. Uh, all right, now then there's the section called crime does not pay enough. I spent several years covering criminal courts before I started covering environmental news for the Times and I saw some really bizarre stuff in the court system as you might guess. I, I used to compare it to having tickets to all the best Broadway shows, you know, the, 
the, not so much the musicals, but all, uh, lots of comedy and lots of tragedy. Uh, one of my favorite stories in, concerned this guy, who I think was the most audacious con man I ever met, a guy named Joe Bujan. Uh, Joe had a long, long list of victims, including a judge. And you say, well, how did a judge get fooled by a con man? Well, uh, it, it, was a, it was a tribute to Joe's ability to multitask. Um, Joe was a fugitive from justice and was being sought by a, a bail bondsman who was tracking him down. But he had his girlfriend with him, and his girlfriend said, I want to get married. And Joe said, no problem. I'll take care of it. Went to a judge, said, Judge, how much would you charge to marry us? The judge named a price. Joe handed him a check. Uh, and the judge married them. And there were a couple of problems with, with that. One was, not only was the check on a bank account that didn't exist, it was a check that didn't exist. Joe had drawn it by hand. <laughs> and it looked so real that the judge just accept, accepted it. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, Joe was a fugitive from justice at, the, at this point, so the judge should have arrested him instead of uh, marrying him. Oh, and there was one other problem. Uh, Joe was still married to his first wife, so he was committing bigamy. So he managed to commit three, three crimes at once in, in one wedding ceremony. Um, uh, I wrote about a pair of twins who for years had gotten the court system completely confused. They were identical twins. Every time one got arrested, he said, it wasn't me, it was, it was my brother. And then the other, they'd go to the brother, and brother would say, no, no, it was, it was him, it was the other guy. And the court system could not keep them straight. Um, and uh, one of my favorites was a piece I wrote about the Sarasota educator who was so bent out of shape about the lyrics to Louie Louie that he actually wrote a complaint letter to Robert F. Kennedy, then the Attorney General, and got the FBI to spend two months investigating Louie Louie. Um, and and uh, they, an agent from the Tampa office went down and interviewed him and got a copy of what were supposedly the dirty lyrics and sent those to J. Edgar Hoover in a special envelope labeled warning obscene lyrics inside. <laughs> the FBI spent two months on this case and finally declared that the lyrics were unintelligible at any speed. Um, uh, one of the great joys of my life though was the 20 years I got to spend covering environmental stories in Florida because so many wild and wacky things happen on the environment beat. It, and so some of that is in the book as well. Um, for years, people in the panhandle talked about a creature called the leopard eel that they swore was real, although nobody had ever really seen it before. It was supposed to be this long, skinny eel with spots and little wings on its head. And people would say, wings on its head? You're crazy. There's no such thing. Well, and then one day, the uh, gentleman there in, on, on the right was out trapping frogs around Eglin Air Force Base and happened to grab a real life leopard eel and said, oh my God, I've heard about this, but I didn't think it really existed. So he contacted his friend and they spent the next several years capturing more and doing all the things you're supposed to do to officially name a new species for science, even though they were doing it on their own time and at their own expense. Turns out it wasn't an eel after all, it's a salamander, a type of salamander called a siren they, they called it the reticulated siren, and those little wings on its head were actually external gills for breathing underwater. Um, this story had an interesting footnote, uh, well, two footnotes. One is, the, one of the scientists said, you know, if this turns out to be real, imagine about all the other stuff that's out there in Florida we don't know is out there, because this has been out there for years and nobody knew for sure that it really existed. The other, um, the other footnote is that after he caught the first one, he first put it into a bucket of water, and then when he got home, he put it in a large Tupperware container to save it. And I put that in the story. Well, about two weeks after the story ran, I got this very sternly worded letter from a patent attorney in New York who said, I represent the Tupperware company. And my client is very concerned that you may have misidentified another company's product, plastic container product, as theirs. Because Tupperware is very concerned about its trademark. Well, I wrote back and said, Listen, I love everything about Florida. I love Florida products. I know Tupperware is based in Kissimmee, and there's even a museum you can go to, the Museum of Tupperware, where you can go around and burp all the products. And, uh, and so I would never, ever, ever slur the name or sully the name of Tupperware. The scientist I interviewed actually used the name Tupperware for the type of container he put it in. He didn't say a, a plastic product. Uh, and in fact, I think your client is missing a bet here. I think Tupperware would be smart to hire this scientist to do an endorsement for their product and, and tell his fellow scientists, if you ever find a mythical creature that turns out to be real, put it in Tupperware to preserve it. That's the best way to do it. For some reason, Tupperware has not taken me up on that suggestion. I don't know why. 
Um, I also wrote about uh, one of Florida's most notorious invasive species, the iguanas. Uh, I don't think you guys have problems with that here yet, but um, uh, they're all over South Florida. There are hundreds and thousands of iguanas running around, and uh, you may have heard that when the weather gets cold, they tend to freeze up, you know, because they're, they're reptiles, they're cold-blooded, and fall out of trees. Uh, and also, they have a habit of popping up in people's toilets. They'll go through the roof vent and down into the plumbing, and then at 5 a.m. you get up to use the bathroom and open the lid, and holy cow, there it is. Uh, and of course, everybody's, everybody's first reaction, what's everybody's first reaction? Flush, 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 flush. Doesn't work, I'm here to tell you, it does, that does not work. You have to call a trapper, they'll come out, they'll use a stick, they'll put the stick in the toilet bowl, and the big lizard will crawl out, and then they can capture it. Um, but um, uh, it's interesting, one of the people I talked to uh, recently said they're now getting 10 phone calls a month about toilet iguanas, which I, on a, I don't know why a sports team has not adopted that name yet. I think that's a, I think that's a natural, because of course you want your mascot to be something, you know, that would scare the other team. What's scarier than a toilet iguana at five in the morning? Um, uh, before I leave this, I should mention, by the way, the, the problem of them falling out of the trees, um, you know, some people like to eat the iguanas. And so a guy who was driving in the Keys one day happened to see 40 iguanas, cold stunned iguanas lying on the side of the road. And he thought, barbecue. So he pulls over, you know, and gets out in the cold winter weather and gathers up these 40 iguanas and puts them in his car and drives for home. Meanwhile, calling his friends, hey, meet me at my house, I'm gonna barbecue. Uh, what he didn't realize is he had the heater on in the car and so the iguanas all revived and started running around the car and he lost control of the car and it ran off the road and he crashed and all the iguanas got away. Um, so uh, he was okay, but you know, bitterly disappointed that he had to just have you know, pork instead of iguana that night. Um, and uh, I had to write about the, the invasive monkeys that are all over Silver Spring. In the 30s, the, there was a captain who ran a, a riverboat tour and around Silver Springs, and he thought, you know, you know what this tour needs, what would really make it, it seem exotic to the customers, is if I had put some monkeys on that island there in the river. And so he got 10 rhesus macaques and turned them loose on the island, thinking, this will be great, I'll, you know, after I make this turn on the river, we'll come by the island, we'll see the monkeys. <clears throat> he didn't realize that the monkeys could swim. And so the monkeys got off the island and spread through the park, and now there are several hundred of them out there. And uh, the, the uh, park service has to kind of cope with that. There's been talk about trying to capture all the monkeys. The problem is the tourists love them. They love seeing monkeys, even though they're not native to Florida. So there you go. And uh, one of the, I'm not gonna give details on this. One of the problems is, um, um, let me just say rhesus feces, which is probably the worst candy flavor ever thought of, but. <laughs> um, since this is the history lecture series, I should mention there are some historic events that I cover in the book. One is uh, an obituary for Snooty the Manatee, who at 69 was the longest lived sea cow in captivity in Florida. Uh, first born when Harry Truman was in office, and uh, he became the official mascot of Manatee County, was kept at the South Florida Aquarium there, um, South Florida Museum, I'm sorry, and Aquarium. And uh, every year they would celebrate his birthday with a big festivities. And the day after his 69th birthday, he got caught inside a, a, uh, a malfunctioning uh, part of the aquarium and, and drowned, unfortunately. But it, what was interesting to me was there were tricks that Snooty had learned when he was just a baby manatee and was known as Baby Snoots. Uh, and he was still doing those tricks when he was 69 years old. He still knew how to you know, roll over on command and take certain, uh, certain foods as favors, things like that. So when people tell you that manatees are not smart, tell them about Snooty. Um, uh, there's a frontline report from the first Florida bear hunt in 21 years. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, there, were, there had been uh, numerous reports, I think five or six reports of bears uh, mauling people because they had not put away their garbage the way they should. And so it reacted to this um, by telling people, let's go shoot bears. Um, and so, a record number of people turned out to, to get licenses. This, this hunt was supposed to go for a full week. Uh, it was over in two days. That's how many bears got shot in the, in, right when it started. And so the, the, uh, the head of the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission said, that's it, we can't shoot anymore, that's it, we're done. And it was so unpopular with the public that they have not held a second one since then. 
Um, uh, and uh, when the 2010 BP oil spill happened off Louisiana, we kept getting reports that the oil was heading towards Florida. And so as a panhandle native, someone who grew up on the beaches there, I went out to Perdido Key to take one last look at an unsullied Florida beach that I'd grown up on and, and kind of write about what that was like. And sure enough, not long afterwards, uh, you know, the, the oil wasn't liquid anymore. It had been, it gotten weathered. So it was this kind of icky brown goo that washed up on the, on the uh, uh, sugar white sands there on, in Pensacola and, all, and, and seven other counties in the Panhandle. And the scary thing is scientists say that even though it appears to be cleaned up, there are still traces of it there uh, if you just dig down far enough. Um, there are some life and death stories in this book. It's not all, it's not all uh, you know, pee your pants funny, as Cynthia Barnett said. Uh, there's one long piece in there about a guy who, it starts off talking about a guy who uh, dies every night at the Arcadia Rodeo. He plays one of the bad guys in their little morality play that they do. You know, they come in and, uh, uh, you know, they're rustlers and they're bank robbers and they're shooting, shooting blanks everywhere. And then the good guys, the sheriff and his buddies come riding in and he gets gunned down every single night. And I use that as sort of a frame to talk about the, his, the real history of Arcadia, which was a rather violent cow town back in the 1800s, that there really were shootouts, there really were bank robberies and rustlers who got strung up. And uh, Frederick Remington, Remington, the famous uh, Western artist, came to Florida in 1895, uh, you know, after, the, after the, the cowboys out west had kind of faded away, came to Florida to see our cowboys and uh, wrote that he found them to be low-browed cow folk who uh, shot and stabbed each other over cattle that weren't fit for a pointer dog to mess on. Uh, so I call that the first uh, literary reference to Florida men, right there. Uh, one, of the, one of the cowboys he sketched uh, is actually sort of a famous figure in Florida folklore. His name's Bone Mizell, Napoleon Bonaparte Bone Mizell. Unlike the real Napoleon, uh, Bone Mizell was a tall and lanky cowboy. He had a phenomenal memory for brands uh, and could do all kinds of sums in his head, but was totally illiterate. He signed his name as an X. Um, but, and he was, a, he was uh, how can I put this? He was well known for his capacity for alcohol as well uh, and for pulling pranks on other people. And so his, uh, the, his fellow cowboys would pull pranks on him as well. Probably my favorite one is where uh, he passed out during a cattle drive. And so they built the fire around his bedroll uh, and he woke up uh, and looked around at the flames all around him and said, dead and gone to hell, no more than I expected. Um, I, I wrote about the guy who'd been on death row the longest from Pinellas County, Amos Lee King. He'd been there for 40 years uh, awaiting execution. He, in effect, his sentence of death became a sentence of living on death row, waiting for death. And uh, it was an interesting conversation because he, he, what he did was absolutely horrible but he had, in his time in prison, had become a different person. And he said, who are you killing now, if you do kill me? Uh, what was really interesting was that the, the son of his victim said, I'm glad. I'm glad they haven't executed him yet. I think it's good to make him wait and make him think about what he did every single day of his life and make him suffer that way. Um, and uh, sort of on the flip side, I wrote about a woman named Susan Morrison whose father had been a, uh, a, a deaf mute caretaker at a, at a cemetery and was killed by a couple of his coworkers for the money in his pockets. It was like $35. They killed him. And, um, and so she has devoted her life to making sure they don't get out of prison. They, they have been eligible for parole under old laws that no longer apply to new, new uh, inmates. They've been eligible for parole for decades, but every time there's a parole hearing, she goes to Tallahassee and makes sure that they don't get it. And, uh, and her son has said when she's too weak to do it anymore, he's ready to step in and continue. Um, the last section of the book is the state you're in, which has general stories about Florida. And uh, the, one of the first pieces is called Don't Oka Humpka My Wee Wah Hitchka, because uh, I had some fun with the place names in Florida. Florida has, I think, the best place names, uh, you know, with the possible exception of the villages. That's kind of unimagined. Too. But, um, uh, you know, there's Sop Choppy and, uh, you know, just some great places. Uh, some of them sound like euphemisms for your naughty bits, like Yalaha, like don't touch my Yalaha. Um, and um, one of my favorites, though, is Two Egg up in the Panhandle, a little, little village uh, remembered mostly for being the birthplace of Faye Dunaway. Uh, to, supposedly, one of my ancestors named it. 
he ran the general store uh, and times were hard and so instead of taking money because nobody had money he would take barter for different things so you know like somebody come in and give him a chicken in exchange for a dress or a shovel or something like that and supposedly he said this town's this town is so poor it ain't even worth two eggs and that's where they got the name <laughs> Um, I told a ghost story about Interstate 4. Believe it or not, Interstate 4 is supposed to be haunted in the Sanford area. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, four German immigrants who lived there and died of a fever, and they died so quickly their priest couldn't get to them to give them the last rites. He had, he had caught the fever as well. And so because they died without getting the last rites, then they, can, they started haunting that spot. Well, the Florida DOT didn't care. Their plans called the for them to put the highway right there, so they ran the pavement right over where the four people were, were buried. And so supposedly they now haunt I-4, haunt the drivers, make sure their cell phones don't work, make sure their cars break down or they get in accidents. My question is, why take it out on the drivers? Why not haunt the DOT? It's their fault, you know? If, there, if there's a ghost appeals court, I think we need to appeal that decision. Um, and uh, I took great pleasure in telling the story of a secret love affair behind Gilchrist Blue Spring. It's a beautiful spring. Uh, just, you know, you, you swim through it and it's like, like you're looking through air. It's so clear. Uh, and it's, the, it's a long ago gift of love uh, from a secret love affair. Uh, this guy who lived in St. Petersburg and was a big wheeler dealer, owned property all over the state, traded stocks and so forth. He hired a woman to be his secretary and over the years, he fell in love with her and they had an affair, but they didn't tell anybody. Uh, and he proposed to her and was gonna marry her, but he got cold feet. Four times he got cold feet. But one time, as a, a pre-wedding gift, he gave her the deed to this spring. And then before he ever married her, he died. But he made her the executor of his estate. And so suddenly she became the big land wheeler dealer and she managed to sell quite a bit of really good environmentally sensitive property of the state, including Whedon Island in St. Petersburg. But she hung on to Gilchrist Blue Spring because it meant so much to her that it was a gift from her secret lover. And then when she died, her family inherited it and ran it as a private spring. Uh, and then after a while they said, you know what, this is an awful lot of work and I'm sure our aunt won't mind. So they sold it to the state. So now you can go visit Gilchrist Blue Spring. It's a state park. Uh, however, there are no mermaids. I hasten to tell you that. It's just, it's just gonna be you up there swimming. Um, several writers get shout outs in the books, writers whose work was influential on me and influential on my writing. Uh, one of them is the guy in the picture there, John D. McDonald. How many people here have read the Travis McGee books? Some more of you need to read the Travis McGee books. Uh, I, I grew up in a family where um, uh, everybody read murder mysteries. My grandfather was a big fan of Perry Mason. My mom read everything Agatha Christie wrote. Uh, and I started off with Encyclopedia Brown and then graduated to Sherlock Holmes and then, you know, the, the hard-boiled guys, uh, Philip Marlowe and Sam Spade and so forth. And when I was 14, my aunt uh, called me over, my great aunt, I'm sorry, uh, called me over and said, it took a big drag on her palm all and said, I think you're ready for Travis McGee now, and handed me uh, this paperback book with a scantily clad woman on the cover. It was The Deep Blue Goodbye, the first Travis McGee book. And of course, being 14, I looked at the cover and said, yes, ma'am, I am. Do you have any others? Um, and so that got me started reading John D. McDonald, who in addition to the 26 Travis McGee mysteries, wrote about 70 other books, uh, many of them set in Florida, where he lived. He lived in Sarasota. And uh, he was, he was uh, one of the first environmental novelists. He wrote about damage to the environment done by what he called fast book artists, people who didn't value the environmental bounty of the state. Um, and uh, it was a real revelation for me because, number one, all the mysteries I'd read before that were set in places like New York and Los Angeles and San Francisco. It never occurred to me that Florida could be a sunny place for shady people or that these beautiful places I'd visited, camped, gone canoeing with my Boy Scout troop or gone hunting with my dad, that they might be in, in peril of being paved over. And so reading his work was a, a real eye-opener for me. Um, and in talking to other fans, I found out that it was even a sort of an intergenerational tie that there would be three generations of Floridians in one family who all read the John D. McDonald books, the Travis McGee books. Um, another one was uh, Elmore Leonard. People think of Elmore Leonard as being a, a guy from Detroit, which is true. That's where he lived part of the year, but part of the year he lived in Florida. And some of his greatest works, the books that really made him a star, are set in Florida or at least start in Florida. Uh, 
and he did a tremendous amount of research. He, he uh, would uh, send, he had a researcher who worked for him and he'd send this guy out into the Ocala National Forest or send him to Wikiwachi Springs to interview mermaids. Uh, one lawyer in, in uh, Fort Lauderdale actually told the paper, I, I think he followed one of my clients home and wrote about what he saw the guy do because it's that accurate about what, what's going on. In each one of Elmore Leonard's Florida books, there are characters from the same family that pop up in minor roles. Uh, the Crow family, uh, Dale Crow Jr. and people like that, where they, uh, they're, they're people who uh, commit crimes accidentally or, or unintentionally and they're not as smart as they think they are. They are Florida men before we started using the term. Um, and I mentioned uh, Encyclopedia Brown, there's a profile in there of Donald J. Sobel, the most successful author you've probably never heard of because he wrote all the Encyclopedia Brown books and didn't want anyone to know his name. He never posed for pictures, he never gave a TV interview, he wanted people to focus on his character, Encyclopedia Brown, and not on him. And so even though his books sold 50 million copies, he was a very retiring, shy sort of guy and so people didn't know who he was. Um, the, uh, and then I, I want to mention one other writer, uh, a very special one, um, Charles Williford, who is known as the godfather of the wacky Florida crime novel. Uh, Williford was a classic pulp fiction writer. He wrote dozens of books that never sold much at all. Uh, and then he wrote this book called Miami Blues in the early 80s that sort of set the stage for Carl Hyacin and Tim Dorsey and the people that came after him. Uh, and it's, it was later made into a movie with Alec Baldwin as the, um, the main character slash psychopath uh, and Fred Ward as the downtrodden detective who eventually tracks him down. Um, Charles Williford used to say that if you write the truth, they'll accuse you of using black humor. And all of his books have this very sharp, sharp satiric edge and very twisted sense of humor to them. Uh, but not everybody got that. Uh, one, of his, one of the sequels to Miami Blues was a book called Sideswipe. And uh, one, of his, one of the people who bought that book in hardback did not like it and made it known by mailing it in a package to Williford along with a note that said, it's a crime to charge this much money for this crap. And uh, in addition to the note, there was a copy of the book that had six bullet holes in it. <laughs> well, Williford's friends and his family were all horrified. They were like, well, you need to tell the police about this. You need to call the FBI or something. He said, no, no, it's good to get feedback. So I'm, I'm hoping I'll get a different kind of feedback from this book. <laughs> um, there are other wild Florida tales that are for sale up front in addition to the state you're in. Uh, Cattail, the wild weird battle to save the Florida Panther, which came out last year. Uh, and it came out in paperback earlier this year. This is a book I wanted to write for 20 years because every time I would write a story about Panthers, I would think this, is a, this would make a great book. There are interesting, unusual characters. Uh, there's a biologist, for instance, who tries to give a dying panther mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, which honestly is a commitment to the job you seldom see in America these days. Um, and um, uh, you know there are twists and turns in the plot you don't see coming. Uh, there's a classic villain who starts off as a hero and then changes side. But I didn't have an ending. I needed an ending. And then finally about five years ago, I got a good ending for the book. Not a happy ending, mind you, but a hopeful ending. And so a lot of people have told me it was a, a really good pandemic read for them because it had that hopeful ending to it. Um, and uh, The Sin of Scandal, Greed, Betrayal, and the World's Most Beautiful Orchid, which is about how Sobe Botanical Gardens in Sarasota wound up facing criminal charges for wildlife trafficking over uh, a guy bringing them this spectacular lady slipper orchid he found in Peru. He, he stuffed it into his suitcase with his dirty underwear, flew to Miami, somehow got it through security there, and this was right after 9-11, and drove to Sarasota where Selby Gardens has this orchid identification center, brought it into them and said, I want you to name this after me. And so they did, which somebody said was tantamount to hanging a sign on his back saying, please come arrest me. Uh, because of course, Peru filed a formal complaint over smuggling this or orchid out of Peru uh, with no permits. Uh, the federal government opened an investigation. There was a grand jury that started issuing subpoenas. Federal agents surrounded this guy's greenhouse in Virginia and confiscated 300 orchids, which that didn't phase him. What upset him was they also confiscated his spec script for a new reality show called The Orchid Hunter, starring him. Um, and I always like to mention uh, with this book that, as far as I know, it is the only book ever classified as true crime slash gardening, 
which I just always feel I always feel bad for the bookstore clerks trying to figure out where that belongs. So um, uh, that's all I've got. Do you guys have any questions that I can answer? Because I'm happy. To, I'm, I'm here to serve. You tell me what you want to know, and I'll. If I don't know it, I'll invent it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, she was asking, what's my favorite part of Florida history to research? I think, I think my favorite part is the, the, uh, the times when the development craze went really crazy, like the 1920s or the 1950s era, uh, where you just see so much bizarre behavior happening. Um, and the, uh, uh, it, it attracts hustlers and, and con men from all over the country to come join in, to the point where uh, Charles Ponzi, the guy who invented the Ponzi scheme up in Boston, got out of jail and came to Florida and got involved in land fraud in Florida in the 1920s. So, so we actually got the guy who, the king of the Ponzi scheme came to Florida. He's like, hey, they got something going on I want a part of. So that's, you can see why that would be appealing. Lots of great stories there. Yes. That's correct. They, they're, they're, native to, they're native to the Thailand area where they're actually an endangered species, but they're doing great here. <laughs> they're, they're, growing, they're going great guns here. No, no. Florida panthers are native. The, the, uh, the um, original ha inhabitants of Florida, the Calusas uh, uh, and so forth, they actually refer to it as a god. Uh, and uh, the Seminoles regard the panther as being the first creature created by the creator, and so their, uh, their medicine men say they're all members of the panther clan. I mean, they, they, they worship the panther for its stealthiness, its fierceness, and so forth. Uh, there's a, um, I have to mention this because there's a new book out about this. There, when they were finding, um, uh, they did an archaeological dig at Marco Island and found all kinds of amazing artifacts from uh, Florida's first inhabitants, and one of them, one of the few that survived being exposed to the air, is what they call the Key Marco Cat. It's this little wooden figurine, carved wooden figurine, that has the bottom half is a woman and the top half is a panther. And uh, there's a new book out about that called The Nine Lives of the Key Marco Cat. What about no, iguanas are definitely not native. They are native to Central and South America, but not Florida, but they do really well here. Um, I have to mention, this is, this is, I love telling this story. I used to work for the Sarasota paper, I worked there for about three years, and um, uh, I heard, and this is in the, like the mid 80s, I heard that this island of Boca Grande was having problems with iguanas, and I thought, iguanas? Who's got iguanas in Florida? That's weird. So I went down to see it. I called up this woman who was a real estate agent down there who said, oh yeah, we got iguanas. So I came down, she was driving me around the island, and as we're driving along, all of a sudden this, this little miniature Godzilla runs across the road in front of us on its hind legs. It's like four feet tall. I'm like, oh my God, what was that? And she said, that's an iguana. That's what I'm talking about. And the, a lot of the people there lived in stilt houses, you know, because of the storm surge and so forth, and the iguanas would get up into the, the insulation under the house and chew on it during the night. So all night long, there'd be this chewing sound, and it just drove people nuts. And so they voted to tax themselves to hire an iguana trapper. So Boca Grande is the only city in America that has an iguana tax. And the trapper, uh, not too long ago, wrote a cookbook called Save Florida, Eat an Iguana. <laughs> yes? One, I know that there was one. Um, that, that's about all I know. <laughs> okay. I mean, did it go awry? Were there, were there like riots and, and, oh, that's probably why I never heard of it then. <laughs> it's, it's only when things go wrong that I take notice. <laughs> okay. I have a question. Yes. Um, I, I, the lion, have you ever eaten a lionfish? And oh. 
do you know anywhere where you can eat lionfish? They you, say it's an invasive and we ought to eat it. Yes. But I've never seen it offered. The, there are, yes, you are, you are not only allowed to eat lionfish, you are encouraged to eat lionfish. And in fact, they have lionfish rodeos now. They've been doing this for a couple of years now for people to compete to who, who would be the one to catch the most lionfish and then they cook them all at the end. And so um, it's an interesting approach to, to an invasive species because some scientists I know are worried that people will then say, well, let's not kill them all off because they taste good. Let's, let's at least keep a few of them around. Well, you can't keep a few. It's like rabbits. They just breed, breed too much. I have not. I have not. I'm, I'm, I my have. tastes tend more toward I fried mullet. And, and they're, <laughs> but, they're, but they're poisonous, you know, unless you, you've got to cut out the, the meat part and separate it from the, from the lion, you know, the spines and all of that. It, and they're, but they're great. Yeah, they're, they're, really supposed to taste, they're supposed to taste really good. But like I said, my, my tastes run more, more toward fried mullet. Um, uh, and now people ask me, can you do the same thing with pythons? And I have to, I generally say no, because the biologists who study pythons say they are packed with mercury, mm. so you shouldn't eat them. But I know a python trapper who has a portable mercury testing kit, and she will test the one she catches, and she says the small ones don't have a lot of mercury in them, and so she cooks them. And she actually does Facebook videos showing off how she's trying out different recipes. So far, she says the liver and onions recipe is the best one. So if you see a small python, it's probably okay to make liver and onions out of that. <laughs> She's also made cookies using their eggs. Craig, I have a, I have a question. Yes. Um, and this is basically goes to your imagination and your curiosity. Uh, but how do you get your stories? I know it's probably going to be hard for you to tell, tell us generally, but how, how, how do you get these ideas to write these stories? Um, I just I pay attention. I mean, I think that's kind of all you can do. Um, there, I mean, I will never run out of Florida stories. There's so people many. People call you up, for example, and yeah, say, hey, I get, you're I get, not going to believe this or whatever. I get story tips via email or phone call from people. Uh, I watch the news. I'm, uh, I use some of our uh, stimulus money to subscribe to seven different Florida papers. So I'm reading papers from all around the state. And, I, you know, I look for trends. I look for odd anecdotes that might highlight other things going on. Uh, and, you know, for instance, the iguanas in the toilet thing, I just noticed that because I saw you know, over the course of about six months, I saw five stories from five different locations about people finding iguanas in their toilets. And I said, that's a trend. I should write about that. <laughs> you mentioned John D. McDonald. And yes. There's a, there's, a, there's a writer who's carried that same theme. He was Randy White. Randy Wayne White lives in Sanibel. Used to be a fishing guide. Yes, Randy Wayne. Yes. And, and it's interesting, his, his, he's asking about Randy Wayne White. Have you guys read any Randy Wayne White books? Yeah, those are really good. And his hero, Doc Ford, used to be a, a, a national security agency employee, a spy, which is really interesting because Sanibel was incorporated by ex-CIA agents. Um, they, they retired there, they started a newspaper, and uh, they did not like the direction that the Lee County Commission was taking with approving development. They liked the island the way it was, they thought it was an island paradise, they didn't want to see it turned into a, you know, a, a wall of condos down the beach. So they pushed for incorporation in their newspaper and it really caught the public imagination and people in Sanibel voted to, uh, to incorporate so they could control their destiny. And so Sanibel remains a fairly pretty uh, and low density impact uh, developed uh, area. So you can still enjoy the beaches, enjoy the views and so forth. Uh, it's interesting that the, um, the Lee County Commission at the time was actually quite notably corrupt. Uh, and several of the commissioners from that time wound up going to prison, uh, in part because they were they had gone to a state uh, uh, association of counties convention in Fort Lauderdale and were caught on video uh, riding down the intercoastal waterway in a yacht with several young ladies they were not married to. Uh, the young ladies had been paid for by a local developer, so that led to arrests and convictions. Great. Yes. Um, I, I, I'll tell you what I'll tell you what they're working on, then I'll tell you what I think might work. Uh, they they're trying everything they can to 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 catch them there. They've d tried to develop an infrared device they can use on drones to go out and detect where they're at. The problem being, you still have to go out and get them. And they are they are masters at hiding. They're you know they're they're great at camouflage, 
and they're ambush hunters, so they're used to holding very still until their prey is near. Uh, they, ca they catch some of them and put radio devices, radio tracking devices on them and turn them loose during mating time in the hopes that they'll lead them to others, and that has worked, but only in certain cases. And again, you have to get to them. I've talked to one scientist who it took him two days to get out to where the python they were tracking had met up with a, a whole bunch of other pythons and was mating. So God knows how much mating went on before he managed to get out to where this thing was. Um, it, they've got dogs that they've trained to follow the scent and try and find the pythons. But once again, the problem is you've got to find them. You know, you've got to get out to where they're at. They, they're, they're really good out in the water where we humans, we're not good once we get off dry land. Uh, I know one python hunter who actually goes out in a canoe trying to hunt pythons in the water, but it's, it's really tough, especially when she's trying to get a 16-footer up into the canoe with her. Um, I, I think, and having talked to a number of scientists, I think what might eventually work, if they're able to perfect it, is, uh, is to basically turn the pythons against each other, to use uh, pheromones. The pythons use the smell of other pythons to, to track them down for mating. They, they use these scents called pheromones, and they're, they are working on an idea to somehow use the pheromones to mislead the snakes about where they should go and so that they wind up not mating. Uh, but they're a long way from perfecting that. So, you know, until then, it's just, it's, the, the game is to try and manage the population, not to get rid of it, because they really, they can't. They can't at this point. Right? Yes. Is there anywhere in Florida where there's a earthworm roundup? Yes. That's what I, I have a vague memory, but I don't know where. Yes. Tell, it, tell the folks how they get the earthworms it's, to come it's, up. That's, it's in one of my, fav one of my favorite place part. names. It's in Sopchoppy. Yeah, Sopchoppy. Sopchoppy. In Sopchoppy, they have the Worm Grunton Festival um, where uh, they go out with these uh, metal stobs that they drive into the ground, and then they rub another piece of metal over the top of it to make vibrations in the ground, and the vibrations drive the earthworms up out of the ground, up onto the surface, and then they run around throw them all in buckets. And uh, apparently this, somehow, the vibrations mimic the sound of moles coming after the earthworms. So they come up to the top to get away from these predators that they think are after them, and instead it's just, it's just vibrations. But uh, this, this happens in the Apalachicola National Forest, and uh, Sopchoppy is very proud of its worm grunting prowess, and so like I said, they actually have an annual worm grunting festival. That's on my Florida bucket list. I don't, I have not been to the Worm Grunt Festival. I want to go. I have a, I have a, I, there's one of the chapters in the book that talks about my, my Florida bucket list, and that's on the bucket list. I've been able to knock off some of them. One was to come here and see all the Frank Lloyd Wright buildings, because, you know, Florida Southern has more Frank Lloyd Wright buildings than anywhere else in the world. And so I was able to knock that one off. I wanted to see a ghost orchid, you know, which was featured in uh, the book The Orchid Thief and in the movie Adaptation. Um, that one was in uh, the Fakahatchee Strand State Preserve, way out in the swamps. You had to wade out to get to it. Turns out, if you go to Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary, which is owned by Audubon and it's down near Fort Myers, you can just walk down the boardwalk about a mile and turn left, and there's one about 100 feet up in a tree. And, you know, bring, bring some binoculars so you can see it. But it's pretty spectacular because unlike most orchids, it doesn't just put out one bloom. It puts out five or six at a time. They actually call it the super ghost orchid. So... Uh, but I still want, I, I haven't done, done some of the others, like the Worm Grunt Festival. I, I, I want to go camping in the Dry Tortugas. I hear that's absolutely gorgeous at night, but you have to bring in your own water. There, there are others, and I, I would encourage all of you to drop a little Florida bucket list on things you want to see and do, uh, because there's so much to see and do in Florida. Great. Yes. The, the gentleman in the raised hat. Uh, I, that's on my bucket list too. Going, Cass, he was asking about Casadega, the psychic capital of America, where there are supposed to be more psychics per square inch than anywhere else in the country. Although I have to tell you, as Dave Barry observed, if they're all psychic, why aren't they always winning the lottery? <laughs> yes. Do you foresee any mass migration within Florida with people coming from the coasts to escape rising seas to central Florida? Uh, not at this point, but um, instead what seems to be happening is that um, people who live on the coast and see their insurance rates going up are starting to move into and gentrify the poorer areas that were not near the coast because people couldn't afford it. And so now they're moving into those areas and having to move 
a lot of those minority homeowners out because the price the prices are going up. Uh, so that's that that's actually been documented in Miami that that is going on there, and so we may start seeing that in other places as well. But so far, there's there nobody's nobody's moving to Orlando yet <laughs> from from uh, from Fort Lauderdale or anything. Yes, ma'am. Can you talk about Ona, where the castle is? I'm sorry, can I talk about? Ona, Florida, where the castle is? Oh, talk about where the capital is? Solomon's Castle. Oh, Solomon's Castle. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I have visited there. I, I checked off that on my bucket list. It's in a, a little town called Ona. Actually, I'm not sure it's actually in Ona. I'm not sure Ona really exists other than as a, as a road sign. But uh, this uh, eccentric artist got hold of a bunch of used newspaper printing plates and built a castle using them. And it, it shines like the Dickens when you drive up on it because, of course, it's all re reflecting those, you know, those metal plates. Uh, and when you go inside, you discover that he had quite a bizarre sense of humor about the way he built this place. Uh, it's, it's worth the visit. Uh, another place that I checked off on my bucket list that I encourage you to, to visit is the Coral Castle down in Homestead. Um, it, it's, it was built by a little five-foot-tall Lithuanian guy whose heart was broken because his bride left him at the altar when he was in Lithuania. And he came to America and determined he was going to build a castle for his queen, and even though she had left him. And so he had this property that had limestone on it, and so he quarried the limestone and built this enormous castle. And nobody quite knows how he did it, because he did most of it by himself. A lot of it was you know, levers and pulleys and things like that. The, there's a gate that weighs three tons and you can swing it open very easily because it's on the axle of an old Model T. It's very well oiled. Uh, he even invented his own um, sundial. It's not like any other sundial I've ever seen that uh, charts not only the, the time but also the days and the months. And the only problem with it is uh, he built it before daylight savings time. So part of the year it's, it's off by an hour. Yes. I'm sorry, the, did you say the Murakami Sanctuary? The, that's the, the one uh, for the Japanese colony that started there. Yeah, I'm, I haven't been. It's on my bucket list. But like I said, it's, you know, it's, I, I know from pictures it's very beautiful. I would like to go. Just well, not Craig, enough hours in the day to go everywhere I'd like to see in Florida. Craig, thanks a lot for your program. Would you sign a book or two if people in Sure, in, I'd even use my real name. <laughs> if, if, people, if people had, a, had, a, had another question? Okay. So we'll, um, we'll see you in October 28th for a topic that, um, that Craig is, is very interested in, of course, and that's, that's uh, Jason Buick oh. going to be here. Tell, oh, tell yeah. everybody about Jason. Um, Jason Buick uh, is a historian. He wrote a book called The Swamp Peddlers that's about, I, you, I mentioned about the, the time when the housing market went crazy. It's about some of the, uh, some of the cleverer con men and ripoff artists who got people to buy property here in Florida sight unseen, much of it uh, uh, underwater uh, in the 50s and 60s. And we, we have to live with the consequences of those things today in places like Cape Coral and, and so forth. Uh, Jason, I should mention, uh, I do a, a weekly podcast called Welcome to Florida, and we had Jason on as a guest to talk mm -hmm. about that book. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you're interested, I very highly recommend the podcast, especially if you're new to Florida. I think it's a good primer on... On, on Florida, because our, our our stated goal is, we, you know, 900 new people move to Florida every day, and nobody tells them what they're getting into. So we're <laughs> we're trying to educate everybody. So we've had our guests have included the Python Hunter I mentioned, who eats her own eats the meat, uh, Gator Wrangler, uh, the head of a nudist recreation society, and no, he was not nude during the interview. Um, um, cockroach expert, shark biologist, um, uh, an expert on sinkholes. I mean, you name it, you name something going on in Florida, we've had an expert on it. Uh, we have not yet had a mermaid, though. I'm still working on that. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thanks again.